That is the big picture. We are right about the spot where Job and his friends start to have a conversation in chapter 4. And our goal is to get all the way from chapter 4, verse 1, to the end of chapter 7, which will be essentially one of the friends speaking to Job and then Job responding. And uh, we've got a lot of ground to cover, so we're just going to dive right in. But make sure you have your Bible open and we're going to do our best to kind of follow a little bit of how this all works. Now, I love puzzles. If you come to my house right now, um, I'm working on one. It's uh, 3,000 pieces. I actually had to take over the ping pong table because it's so big, it doesn't fit in a regular thing. And not many people are playing along with me yet, but maybe they will now that I've kind of pointed the finger at all my family. Uh, and there's a deadline because the ping pong table doubles as a large dining room table and Easter's coming. Uh, so the puzzle has to be done. But I, I love puzzles because they, they, they're just sort of fascinating, right? How the pieces fit, of trying to work it all together. And some of them are more challenging and different. And you've probably seen the ones where like every piece is the same thing. I used to have one as a kid. It was a Rubik's Cube puzzle. Every piece was the same shape, and you had to put it all together, all the pieces, to solve the faces of a Rubik's Cube. But as I discovered, it was impossible. It was possible to put the puzzle together so that you got to the very last piece only to discover that the last piece didn't fit. You had to take it all over and do the thing all over again, um, which we ended up throwing it out. But that's a whole other story. Um, but for those of you who love puzzles like me, you probably are drawn to the book of Job because in some ways <coughs> it's a giant puzzle where we have the pieces and we're struggling through the whole book to try to figure out how do the pieces fit together. So I just want to make sure as we dive in that we, we see the pieces that the different people who are going to speak through the next number of chapters are trying to fit together. And they're fairly simple. There's only a few of them. The first piece is this. God is in control. And what's interesting through the whole book, there will be no one who will challenge that. Everyone agrees. There is a God. He is in control. The second piece that the friends of Job seem very confident is that God is just or fair. So everything he does must be just. We're going to see that this one for Job becomes a little bit of a challenge. Which leads us to the third and the final piece is... When Job suffers, as he does, if God is fair and in control, then his suffering must be punishment. Because otherwise, it would be unfair. And if God's in control of this world, then suffering must equal punishment. And there's a flip side to it, although it's not said, it's certainly an undertone through the whole book. And I think Job at different points kind of points in this direction. It probably also means that when his friends who aren't suffering are blessed, they're being rewarded. Now, those are the pieces. Now, what we're going to see through the book is that the friends of Job figured out that it fits together perfectly and beautifully as long as you continue to maintain this with absolute strict application. God's in control. He's just. Therefore, Job, the only question that is left to be answered is, what is your sin? And through all these chapters, all the speeches of these friends, they will continue to come back and hammer over and over and over at Job. Absolutely convinced this man has sinned and we just need to expose it. They will come at all different angles to this question. They will come to him at one point and say, Job, we are absolutely sure that you are full of iniquity. One of his friends will actually say by chapter 22, uh, the, the fellow that we're going to read here in verse in chapter four, he speaks again and he actually comes to Job in chapter 22 and says, essentially, Job, we, we know that you're a sinner. And in fact, I think I know what it is. Job, you're a very wealthy man. And do you mean to claim that in accumulating all that wealth, you never crossed over the line? You see what he's saying? He's going to say, Job, I know your sin. There was something you did in accumulating the flocks and the camels and all that that was sinful. And now, Job, you're being punished. In fact, another one of the friends will actually come right out and say to Job, Job, not only are you being punished, but you know your ten kids who died 
in chapter one, part of the story, they also must have been sinners. I mean, it's it's strange comfort because we're told in chapter two, verse 11 to 13, that the friends come to comfort him. Strange comfort. (laughs) Job, you're a sinner and your kids are, too. Now, that's their. Their way of putting the puzzle pieces together. Job has a little bit of a different way of putting the puzzle pieces together. It was alluded to in that little video. God is in control. But he's not suffering because of his punishment. Therefore. What do we do with the justice of God? And Job will come at this question over and over and over again, saying, I don't know exactly how things work, but I know I have not sinned. Well, in fact, at one point he will say, I have sinned, but if forgiveness is a real thing, then I've also been forgiven. And surely the sin that I have committed is not worth the kind of suffering I'm experiencing. In chapter 7, verse 20, he basically says that. So Job's wrestling with how to put those pieces together through all these chapters. And essentially, that's what these speeches or this conversation is going to boil down to. Trying to wrestle with those pieces of who is God and how will this all work? And I think probably as you even see that, there's probably not many of us sitting in this room who at one point in our lives have not wrestled with the pieces of a puzzle that looks like that. Going In those quiet moments, as I consider the situation I'm in, I'm not quite sure how to put together those pieces. Now, the video says really essentially there's no answer at the end of the book of Job. I'll just... Let me just do a quick spoil alert. There is no answer suggested, but what is suggested is there is an answer. God has an answer. It's just not going to be something Job's going to be able to understand. So just in case you're left kind of going, hold on a second. You mean we're going to get to the end of chapter 42 and not have an answer to these questions? Is there an answer to this? The book of Job is going to clearly say yes. But you're going to have to trust the Lord. He has answers that we can't even fathom. But along the way, we run into some very interesting issues that we need to consider. And so that's what we're going to work through a little bit today here together. I'm going to read um, the first eight verses, not out of the ESV, which is the translation I normally use, out of a, a simpler version that maybe just in putting it in very plain terms will help us get the feel of how Eliphaz begins to speak to Job. Let me read it. You can follow along in your Bible. I'm just reading from verse one to eight. Then Eliphaz from Teman spoke up. Would you mind if I said something to you? He's speaking to Job. Under the circumstances, it's hard to keep quiet. You yourself have done this plenty of times, spoken words that clarify, encouraging those about to quit. Your words have put stumbling, stumbling people on their feet and put fresh hope in people about to collapse. But now, Job, you're the one in trouble. You're hurting. You've been hit hard and are reeling from the blow. But shouldn't your devout life give you confidence now? Shouldn't your exemplary life give you hope? Think, has a truly innocent person ever ended up on the scrap heap? Did genuinely upright people ever lose out in the end? It's my observation that those who plow evil and sow trouble reap evil and reap trouble. There, he says it. Job, you have been such a good friend to so many. You have come along and counseled them in their difficult moments. Now I'm going to come alongside you in your difficult moment. And the thing I want to remind you of, Job, is something that we know beyond a shadow of a doubt. When you sow evil, you reap evil. If you do something evil, that's the product. It is unmistakable, Job, that you are suffering because you are a guilty man. And Job, if you would just admit it, own up to it, everything would work out because God's good. You're you're a good guy. And surely God would restore everything. Now, that's where the speech is going to go through two chapters. What I want to do is try to give you a little bit of a, an outline of the speech, because all these speeches are written Hebrew poetry. And so if you read through them, as I have many, many times over and over and over, we're left with all these images and descriptions. Some of the times we're left wondering, it's like, what on earth are these people talking about? What are they trying to prove? What point are they trying to make? I'm going to give you a framework 
of what I think they're saying, and then we'll kind of work through it a little bit together. Eliphaz basically preaches a sermon to Job that's got four main points to it. The first one is this, from chapter 4, verse 1 to verse 11. Job, I want you to be consistent with what you and I both know is true. That. Job, we need to be consistent. From chapter 4, verse 12 to chapter 5, verse 7, he says essentially, Job, I want you to be realistic about what it means to be human. But first, I want you to be consistent with what we know to be true. In other words, God's not making exceptions, Job. It's not that this morally ordered world that functions like this 100% of the time functions like it for everyone except for you, Job. So let's be consistent. Now, secondly, Job, let's be realistic about what it means to be human. Third, Job, I want to warn you. It would appear to me that pride has kept crept in. And so from chapter 5, verse 8 to 16, Job, humble yourself. And then lastly, the last part of his speech from chapter 5, 17 to 27. Job, I plead with you to submit to the discipline of God. Now you understand why he's saying that. It's because he's saying God's punishing you. And Job, just admit it, deal with it, and you can move on. Now that's sort of his speech through those two chapters. Let's kind of have a look at some of the specifics. We don't have time to work through every little part of it, but we, we can hit the high moments here through this. So firstly, he says, Job, we need to be consistent with what we both know to be true because, Job, you and I both know that's true. He will never concede that there could be something else at play. He will never, never admit that there could be a purpose or a way that God works that would be different than this. In other words, he's put God in a box and said, God must always do this. And yet we know from chapter 1 that there's pieces to this story that Eliphaz could never... He doesn't even seem to consider. That there could be a purpose that God might have that would be different than what's going on here. All through this, as I mentioned, Eliphaz is convinced that he needs to somehow expose the sin of Job. If he could just expose the sin and convince Job to just own up to it, then everything would function properly again because God would surely restore and forgive him. In fact, if you look at the end of chapter 5, he, he says that. That's, that's the ending point. That's the just submit to the discipline of God, Job, because everything will work out well. He ends up saying in verse 24 of chapter 5, You shall know that your tent is at peace. You will inspect your fold and miss nothing. You will know that your offspring will be many and your descendants as the grass of the earth. In other words, Job, you just got with the program. Admitted you were a sinful man. Admitted that this is all God's discipline for some sin that you have done. God would restore it all. Those flocks that you used to have that counted in the thousands, oh, you'd have them back. And not one would miss. The family that you used to have, all those kids, Job, you would, you would have it again. Your offspring would be like the, the grass, so many. You would come to your grave in the ripe old age like a sheep gathered up in its season. Behold, this is true. We've searched it out. We know it. It's for your good. Job, this is all for your good. It's the point, Job. And if you just admitted it, it would be like it would all go away. Now, as he wrestles through this little sort of speech, he gets to chapter 4, verse 8, and he he kind of arrives at sort of what's the heart of his argument. I have seen those who plow iniquity and sow trouble reap the same. In other words, he said, I've lived life, Job. I've looked around. I've watched how it works. I've seen it with my own eyes. There has never been an exception, Job, and you are not the first. Now he goes on and he describes in sort of poetic language how this plays out. By the breath of God they perish. By the blast of His anger they are consumed. In other words, Job, if you're going to violate the principles of God, He's going to destroy you. And so Job, if you're being destroyed, we can kind of back this whole thing up and we can reach a very clear, simple conclusion. Job, you violated the principles of God. Then he uses an illustration. And by the way, most of the poetry as you read through it, are illustrations of the points being made. It's just we're not familiar with the language, so sometimes it's hard to kind of understand why all of a sudden is Eliphaz talking about a lion? I thought we were talking about Job and his sin and the consequence and sowing and reaping, and then 
Then Eliphaz says, verse 10, the roar of a lion, the voice of the fierce lion, the teeth of the young lions are broken. The strong lion perishes for lack of prey and the cubs of the lioness are scattered. There. I proved it. But if you're like me, you're going, I, what's, what's the proof? What's the point? It was, for us, we maybe don't think of lions in the same way that Eliphaz would. We see them on, you know, planet Earth and they're cute and they're kind of fluffy manes and they do cute things rolling around in the grass. But if you can imagine living thousands of years ago, a lion was a predator, a fearsome predator that destroyed things and destroyed lives. And so lions were not sort of connected with sort of cute, cuddly creatures that we turn into teddy bears. They represented wicked, destructive things. And Eliphaz pulls out this example and says, Job, you get what you sow. Consider a lion. They do wicked, destructive things. They terrify us. But look what happens. Their teeth break. They run out of food and they perish. You see, it is a just world. They're wicked. They get what's coming to them. And Job, my friend, you are no different than a lion. It's just how the world runs. Now, all through this chapter, that that's the consistent point he's making. As he comes into chapter 4, verse 12 to 16, he describes a, a dream he has. It's very, very interesting language. It's It's like someone saying, I have a... I have a revelation from God. By the way, this is a caution. If you ever hear someone say, God has revealed something to me. If by that they don't mean like I open my Bible and now I'm going to read it, what he revealed. They mean it's something that they've dreamt up. Be extremely cautious. Oh, I beg you to be cautious. Because this man, Eliphaz, essentially says, I had a dream. He, he, he sort of couches it in very interesting language. Listen to it. Verse 12, a word was brought to me stealthily. My ear received the whisper of it. And had thoughts from visions of the night when deep sleep falls on men. Dread came upon me. Trembling made my bones shake. A spirit glided past my face. The hair of my flesh stood up. It stood still. I could not discern its appearance. A form was before my eyes. And then in the silence I heard a voice. It's like, ooh, better pay attention to this. This is kind of... I don't think there's a thing in here that leads me to think this is God revealing anything to him. And then here's what he says. Can mortal man be right before God? Can a man be pure before his maker? It's rhetorical questions. His answer is clearly no. There is no way on this planet for a man or woman to be right before God. Now, remember the argument? So therefore, Job, if you are a mortal man... You are not right before God. That's He's just hammering it home over and over from all the different directions he can pull it. And so he says, Job, be consistent because we all know this is the way it is. Now he moves on to his second point in chapter 4, verse 12. Be realistic. Be realistic, Job. Like, you are a fragile, frail, weak man because we all are. That's his point. He, in fact, goes on in the end of chapter 4, verse so 19. He starts comparing man to angels. He said, if angels are, are not perfect, then how can you say you are? Are you saying you're better than an angel? He says, you want to know what we're like, Job? We're like a moth or a tent that's held up with one string. Have you ever gone camping? I'm not a huge, huge camping fan. But I've done enough to know that if you have a tent and you've got one string, your odds of having a successful night are pretty low. He says, Job, that's what we are like. That's what humanity is like. Verse 21. The tent cord's plucked up. Or, Job, we're like a moth. Have you ever caught a moth in your hands and you catch it and you hold it and the dust comes off and then you try to let it go? You'd never intended to kill it. You thought it was going to fly away, but the second you touched it, it was destroyed. Eliphaz says, Job, that's humanity. We are so frail. And Job, you need to understand. You need to be realistic about this. Your suffering, the frailty we're seeing, it's deserved. You earned it. And you've earned no better. 
This is this famous verse in chapter 5, verse 7. <clears throat> Man is born to trouble as the sparks fly upwards. He just says, Job, that's just the way it is. Had a campfire, the sparks go up. It's just, they don't go down. They don't, that's just the way it goes, Job. And trouble comes to humanity. It's just the way it is, Job. Be realistic. Don't try to make this strange argument that you're actually innocent and you're suffering and somehow somehow that fits with the puzzle pieces because Job, it just doesn't. So be realistic. Therefore, Job, chapter 5, verse 8 to 16, you need to humble yourself. God is great. And actually, it's an incredible statement. Read sometime from verse, oh, I don't know, 8 to 16 there. It's one of the a brilliant statement about who God is. He's majestic and powerful. He frustrates the crafty, but He gives rain to the earth. It's just, it's just a beautiful description of God. And he essentially says, Job, God is so amazing and you are not. You ought to just stop trying to protest and just humble yourself right now. It's interesting, actually. Right, I'll just... A little aside, verse 13 of chapter 5 is the one verse in Job that's quoted in the New Testament. It's in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I think it's verse 9 or 19. I think it's one of those nine ones. Maybe 11. Anyway, somewhere in there. Paul quotes, uh, uh, he catches the wise in their own craftiness. Which is very interesting because this is Eliphaz. This is not Job and it's not God. And yet Paul quotes him saying, this is a true statement. This is actually what God does. Which leads us to an interesting, puzzling problem with most of the book of Job. Most of what the friends are saying is not untrue. <laughs> it's very true. God is great. And God is in control. And God is just. And suffering often is the result of punishment. And blessing often is a reward. Most of what they're saying is true. We're going, okay then... <laughs> Then whose side are we supposed to be on? Are we on Job's side? Like, who are we cheering for through the book? Right? It's part of the puzzle of the book. I want to suggest to you something that really, just, I think, simply helps me out. It's not a matter that, that we're trying to figure out truth from error through this book. We're trying to figure out how do you apply truth appropriately. It's like a tool. So yesterday, um, a bunch of the guys after men's breakfast stayed and some others showed up and helped us load up the Bethlehem Star trailer. We've got the slivers. Do you still have the slivers, Sean, to prove it? Because we didn't tell anyone to bring gloves. So we thought that would be fun. Um, right? And so we came home and tried to get slivers out. And um, somewhere around here I have a proper tool. I don't know. No, I lost it. Anyway. So I, I thought by way of example, you look, imagine if you had a sliver. So Doug, you've got a sliver. I don't know if you actually do or not. But imagine if you did and you said you need some help. And I said, come on up here, Doug. i got a tool. I'll help you take out sliver. And then I pulled out this. Are you going, well, it's a tool. And there's a time and a place for the tool. If you're laying flooring, that would be a good time. So, okay, imagine though if I said, well, if you don't want that one, I got this. Let's pull it out. Just hold out your hand. It'll all be fine. Are you going, it's a tool. There's a time and a place for the tool. But it's not for slivers or, you know, hedge cutters. Right? There's a time and a place where those are incredibly helpful. But I Oh, there's my tweezers. <laughs> right? But if I held out this and said, okay, now there's time and a place for this tool, and this is a good one for slivers. There's multiple tools, and there's a time and a place for them. Now, Scripture is not a tool. It's incredibly helpful and useful. But there is a time and a place for the truth of God's Word to be applied in our lives. And the thing that is, I think, frustrating to Job is he knows these pieces are all true. They're just they're misapplying them. You don't say to a guy who's on an ash heap, covered in sores, broken because he's lost everything, you don't come along to him as one of his friends does and says, Job, you're actually lucky. You deserve worse. That's what one of his friends says, the comforters. You've got off light. You should actually thank God because if He punished you for the what you truly deserve, it would be much, much worse than you just losing everything you own, including all your kids. So Job, you should actually be thanking God right now. Is that true? Hmm. It's an interesting one for us, isn't it? 
There is a sense in which there is some truth to that. None of us are punished on this planet the way we deserve. But it's certainly not the thing that you come along to someone when they're hurting and say, hey, actually, you should be just grateful it's not worse. Job's friends just seem to be able to misapply God's word at every turn. So Job, be humble. Lastly, chapter 5, verse 17 to 27. They said, Job, we want you to submit yourself to the discipline of God. They actually come along and they say, chapter seven, uh, 5, verse 17. <clears throat> Behold, let me put, let me just make sure we get the words right. Happy is the one whom God reproves. Job, you should be happy right now. This is great. God's disciplining you. Therefore, despise not the discipline of the Almighty. For he wounds, but he binds up. He shatters and he heals. He will deliver you from six troubles. In seven, no evil shall touch you. In famine, he will redeem you from death. In war, from the power of the sword. In other words, Job, if you would just submit yourself and accept the punishment that is clearly coming because you are a sinner, God would restore. But the problem, Job, is that you are unwilling to submit to him. And so, Job, I urge you as a friend to submit to the discipline of God. Now, like I said, so much of it sounds pretty good. Except you and I both know there's a chapter one to the story. Something else is going on here in the story that Eliphaz is clueless to. That if he knew would no doubt radically alter his counsel. And so it's no surprise to us when we come to Job's response that he's not going to just say, you know what, you're right. You're right. I just need to submit to the discipline of God. I just need to agree with everything you said. This is just the way it is. Because Job knows it's not that he's suffering because he was sinful. There has got to be another piece to this. We actually know it's the complete opposite, don't we? If we've read chapter 1, he's suffering because... He's actually the most blameless human on the planet. And God has handpicked him and said, Satan, consider this man. He is blameless. The suffering is not a result of sin in this case at all. By the way, just a little pointer for us as we try to think through suffering on the other side of the cross. Um, never lose track of the redemptive purposes of suffering. Everything in the New Testament, I could take you to passage after passage. Colossians 1, uh, 2 Timothy 2. A number of places where, where Paul just seems to point out that somehow God in His justice, in His sovereignty, in His love, in His mercy, is somehow using the suffering of His people for redemptive purposes. That's a profoundly important thing. That, Sort of not totally related to Job, but it certainly is related to us. So we've got we've got Eliphaz's speech. Kind of see how it works, Job. Just kind of deal with reality, Job. Now we get Job's response, and his speech actually kind of heads in two directions. Chapter six, he replies to his friends. Chapter seven, he speaks to God. We know that because in Hebrew, some of the verbs are plural and some are singular. In other words, for chapter six, they're plural. He's speaking to three guys who have there, been there to comfort him. And in chapter seven, he speaks and it's singular. Now he's directing his his words towards God. And he's got a very simple format he's going to follow as he speaks to his friends. He's first going to tell them that the wrath of God is an unbearable pain from chapter 6, verse 1 to 13. And then second, he's going to tell them from verse 14 to the end of that chapter, verse 30, that religion brings him no comfort at all. This, this has done nothing to help. Okay, that's that's his response to them. So he starts off, verse 1, he answers and said, Oh, that my vexation, vexation were weighed. The vexation is basically just the words of anguish. Remember what he did back in chapter 3? As he pours out his heart. Essentially saying to his friends, you didn't even listen. You didn't even, you didn't even get it. In fact, throughout the book, he will charge them with that multiple times. At one point, he will say to them, you won't even look me in the eye. You will look away and you will tell all this great sounding stuff. But he said, I just wanted a friend who would just sit there and just look me in the eye. He said, if you could weigh my misery and put it on a scale, what does it weigh? He said it's, it's the weight of all the sand on this earth. So that's my misery. And you've missed it. 
Now he goes on and describes what it feels like to him or, or why he figures it's happening. Verse 4, the arrows of the Almighty are in me. It's like God is there shooting me full of arrows. That's what it feels like. He said, you haven't looked, you haven't heard, you haven't realized. Then he goes on and he, he starts talking about a donkey in verse 5. Uh, does the wild donkey bray when he has grass? The answer is no. Donkeys apparently bray. Now, I'm not a donkey person, but apparently... From what he's saying and what we know, someone can correct me maybe later, donkeys apparently bray when they're hungry and then they're quiet when they're fed. And what Job is saying is, guys, I'm like a donkey in the sense that the reason I will not stop crying out and complaining is that you should have come and you should have comforted me. But listen to what he says their words were like. Can that, verse 6 and 7, can that which is tasteless be eaten without salt? Is there any taste in the juice of the mallow? My appetite refuses to touch them. There is as food that is loathsome to me. In other words, you showed up, Eliphaz, and you spoke for two chapters, and you should have been speaking words that would have ministered to my heart, and I would have received them as good. And they would have brought me hope and brought me comfort. But instead, what came out of your mouth is useless. That's why I keep complaining. Now, I, I love this. We'll do this one just because we got our kids with us here this morning. So verse 6, he uses a word about the juice of the mallow. Now, we're not exactly sure. You probably have a footnote that says, you know, we don't know what this word means. It's something that is edible, that is disgusting. There's actually four options. One is um, some sort of vegetable, <laughs> which I know some of us is like, yes. Most types of vegetables, particularly turnips. Um, or the other option is some sort of soft cheese. Some of you don't like soft cheese, so you get it. Others of us do. That's like, well, soft cheese, that's delicious. Or uh, my son helped me out with this one last night because he knows a bit more Hebrew than I. He said apparently it can be used for an egg. So if you don't like eggs, again, I like eggs. But maybe it's that like liquidy because the, the idea is it's not so much the thing. It's more the consistency. I was sort of looking into this. And so that's why we kind of it's like soft cheese, kind of a runny, gooey egg or the one I really love. It's actually this word is used historically to describe the mucus coming out of the nose and mouth of a man who has gone mad. That's just a free one. And it's almost lunch. So that just kind of like puts your appetite away for a few more minutes so we can keep going. So he says, you show up and your words are like either. Sort of like a raw egg that you expect me to eat, mucus coming out of the nose or mouth of a madman, some sort of weird vegetable or soft cheese. In other words, I can't eat any of them. Didn't do anything to help me. That's his claim of his friends. You should have shown up and helped, but you haven't. And the wrath of God is just unbearable. He actually gets down to verse oh, 9 and 10 where he starts coming. It starts to sound a lot like chapter 3 where he says, I just wish God would crush me. I like, just end my misery. Quit toying with me and playing with me and just... Do it. But I love his reason in here. And don't for a second think that Job ever loses hope in the Lord. Listen to the reason he wants God to do this. Verse 10. This would be my comfort. Meaning if God were to crush me, this would be my comfort. I would even exalt in pain, unsparing. Doesn't matter how much it hurts. I would be okay with it. Why, Job? Why could you be okay with that? Here's his answer. For I have not denied the words of the Holy One. Saying I'm close. Like I'm at the end. In the next verse, he starts talking about his failing strength. He said, I'm not made of metal and bronze. I'm weak. I'm flesh. And I feel like I'm getting to the end of my ability to take this and not curse the Lord. And so I would rather Him kill me now so that I would never curse, never deny His word. Even in the midst of this immense suffering, here you have a guy who's saying, I don't want to deny him. And I'm not sure how much longer I can go. But it's pretty clear all through here that he is going through immense suffering. Then verse 14, he starts talking about the fact that what they are saying to him is bringing no comfort at all. Their responsibility in verse 14 was to show up and be true friends. And he uses a word that's used often for God. The word has said, meaning like a loyal love that they would have poured out on him. But they showed up and there's none of it. He said they showed up and actually it reminds him, verse 15 to 21, of a wadi, which is a, a river of sorts that flows in the winter. But then when you need it in the summer, when you actually need water, it's dried up. <laughs> I thought you were going to come when I heard you were going to come. 
Maybe something in his heart lifted. And then they arrived. And all there is is disappointment. You can imagine that. A caravan. You're traveling through the summer. You're dying of thirst. And someone in the caravan says, Oh, I remember. A few miles up. I remember passing through here once before. And there was a river flowing. And everyone's spirits lifted. And they're like, Let's get there. Because we're going to be saved. And so they travel to the spot where they knew this water had flown. And they arrived. And it's parched. Job says, you want to know how I feel? That's that moment right there. When you first lay your eyes on a dried up riverbed. Eliphaz, that's how I feel right now. You've done nothing to help me. In fact, he says, none of this is helping me right now. Now, That's kind of where he gets to as he works through his speech to his friends. Friends. They haven't done anything to help. Then in chapter 7, he begins to speak to God. And here's how he does it. Verse 1 to 10, he, he asks a question, maybe a question you've wrestled with at some point, which I guess I would just put like this. Do I matter? God, do I even matter to you? Because Job's starting to doubt that he matters. Say, if I mattered, would, would my life be happening the way it is? Because I'm not sure how to put the pieces together in this and still have the confidence that I matter. He starts talking about the temporary nature of life, how it's fleeting before his eyes. He can't sleep at night. He's tormented at night. And then he wakes up and the days go by like that. And the prime of his youth just flashes before his eyes. Goes back to sleep at night. He can't sleep. He's tormented. He wakes up the next day and the days go by. He's like, I feel like I must not matter. Because that's how life feels. Then verse 11 to 21, it's a plea to God very strange plea where he basically just says, God, would you please just leave me alone? If this is what it's going to look like for you to have your eye on me, that's the expression he uses. He said, I'd be better off for you just to ignore me completely. Because it seems like every time your eye focuses on me, my misery increases. So God, I just want you to just ignore me. Now, this is a rough place to stop. Um, and we're going to have a few of those as we work through the book of Job. Because the not nice, neat, wrapped up package speeches where it all resolves and we go, oh, phew. Now we see how he put the pieces together. Instead, we're left with a shocking puzzle going, we don't know how this is going to land. We do. We, we know in the end, I hope you've looked ahead and kind of realized that the, the book does end. The book does land. God does show up. The The... The confusion over this is resolved. But along the way, we're going to have a few awkward moments. So I'm going to throw out just seven seven thoughts really quickly that I hope you see. They're very short. And then we're going to wrap this up and I'm going to pray for you. But uh, make sure you come back next week. We're going to pick up the next speech and keep working our way through here. So what are seven things that I see as I read through these first four chapters of the speeches? Number one, the wrath of God is unbearable. We would be fools to try to minimize it. Beyond fools. Like, I can't, if your approach to this is to say, oh, you know what? It's not that bad. Just treat it lightly. That is the epitome of what it would mean to be a fool because one day we're all going to face him. And if we face him in our sin and actually face the wrath of God that we deserve, we don't even know the half of it in looking at the story of Job. Number two, the greatest religious words often don't provide comfort. You've been there. I know I have. (laughs) I've had people come to me in moments that are difficult and they've got great sounding things to say. And then I had other people come to me in those moments and all they do is just sort of sit there, maybe pray with me. It's like that's where the comfort comes from. But the one thing that I believe 100% would have been a comfort to Job that we have that he didn't yet know is that there's a cross and Jesus died on it. And if you're going to try to comfort someone, never, ever, ever diminish the power of the message of the cross of Christ. Number three, it's the wrestling of Job that eventually leads him to a firm place again. Don't try to short-circuit wrestling. Don't try to say it's uncomfortable and a little bit messy and we're not quite sure and ooh, he said that. What do we do with what he said? And so probably you at some point in your life will get to wrestle with some things of the Lord. Don't be fearful of it. Just don't stay in it. 
keep wrestling. Job does. It's interesting to me that once the, once the friends start running out of things to say near the end of the book, you know who's the only one left still talking? It's Job. He just will not let go of God. Like, I've got to find an answer. The friends seem to be able to walk away from it, but Job's like, no, no, I'm going to cling to God. I will find an answer. But it's the wrestling that leads him to that. Number four, the comforters fail. There's all sorts of reasons. We'll probably pick some of these up in the weeks to come. One of them is certainly pride. They are absolutely convinced of what they know, that they know, that they know, and they are unwilling to entertain anything else. Be careful as you come alongside people who are suffering that your pride doesn't put you in the exact same spot of knowing what they need to hear and announcing it and proclaiming it and being surprised when it didn't help. So one of the things I think they're afraid of, actually at one point Job will claim that they are afraid is I think they're afraid that that as they look at Job and as they look at this, that somehow if they don't maintain this argument, they can't maintain their goodness. <laughs> I think they're afraid of that. As long as the world works this way and Job's suffering and they're not, the only conclusion they can reach is we must be good. And they are unwilling to ever consider anything else. Be careful of pride as you're caring for others. Number five, if you fail to factor in the patience and waiting of God as you deal with suffering, you're probably going to end up putting the pieces together wrong. So much of Scripture, so much of what suffering seems to be about, so much of what we learn is that God has purposes, but they're slower than what we might hope. And if you try to short circuit and speed it up and cram pieces together, and forget that God is a God who acts on behalf of those who wait, you will have a puzzle that's all askew. Number six, there are times when God's ways will leave us more confused, not less. I'm I'm convinced of it. I don't mean there isn't truth. There isn't something sure and stable upon which to stand. God is faithful and He's good. I don't mean that. But sometimes what He's doing and how He's doing it might leave us sort of scratching our heads. And it's, again, probably okay to be there at times. Because if you, again, try to fit pieces together in an an awkward way, you're probably going to end up having to bend truth to make them fit. Lastly, number seven, never lose hope and faith that God has reasons you cannot see. I think if if there's any conclusion to the book of Job, it must be that. That he has reasons. That this world's not in chaos. That God hasn't lost control. That He isn't unjust. But there are purpose. There are seen ones that we may never see. And I'm going to leave you with a question. Alright? You might want a piece of paper to write down two verses. Chapter 4, verse 7 and chapter 4, verse 17. And here's your assignment this week. In chapter 4, verse 7, Eliphaz asks a question. Has the innocent ever perished? Has the upright ever been cut off? And then in verse 17, can a mortal man be right before God? Can a man be made pure before his maker? I want to try to answer those questions. Has there ever been an innocent man cut off? Is there a way possible for men and women just like us to be made pure and right before God? I'm going to point you and say, have a look at the life of Jesus Christ. Consider him as you answer those questions.